Hello. Hope we are online and the audio works. Let's see. There is a huge delay, Great. so that's the... Yeah. But it seems to work, right? We need a little bit uh, higher Ville's uh, microphone. Uh, so just a little bit, really? Ville. Uh, oh, no. Wait a moment. Yes, is it now better? Now might be better. Okay. Yes. Yes. Good. 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 Okay. Okay. I think it's it's perfect now. So, welcome to the Games Now Online Game Jam number one. Uh, this is the first time we do this online. We've done some game jams in the physical form at the Alta University campus before with all of the people invited as well. This is an online jam, so we can reach even higher number of people to join in the teams to get a create a game. And this time we have almost a week for the jam creations. My name is Anna Casa Kultima, and I'm the host for this jam together with my uh, co-host Ville Kankainen. Hello. And <laughs> we have been planning this jam for a while now and uh, all the technical difficulties that we've had to reach this. So originally we wanted to do this on the premises of the Aalto University in Espo in Helsinki, in Espo in Finland. And due to the circumstances that we are all very well aware of, we are not doing it like that. So we are at the home studios of each and every one of us and working distantly with different kinds of hot fixes there and there. Uh, so today we will have a talk show of the jam to kickstart the thing and also give you the design constraint. And uh, just to open up a couple of the things of how this jam also works. So we, we do have a each IO page for the jam, right? Yep. And then we have some uh, giveaways too. So maybe we we'll could show the stickers in the in his tiny yeah. screen. Yes, yes. We have Here. some stickers. Yes. And then we have uh, the thing that you see also in the in the picture there. We have this physical gift. Um, is a is a very well a nice quality of the water bottles. We'll will uh, tell you how to uh, read those a bit f further away from this. Uh, the address for the jam page can be found there. I can also show it to you with a bit of a bigger text here. Yeah. So this is where this is where you should be aiming for in order to join the jam itself. And then we have a Discord channel of which link I actually don't have a link now, but you can find it on the jam page as well to help your teaming up. So those are the kind of the rudimentary things for for how to set up your jam and just to kind of intro us so I'm a game scholar at Alto University been doing game studies and game jams for such a long time already and uh, Vila you can say a couple of words of you why are you here with us yeah hey I'm uh, Ville like has been said already and uh, I'm also working in the the University currently and also I'm a PhD student in Tampere University. So we've been we, doing game research some some time already, yes. Yeah, so we've done game research, but also both of us have in, uh, kind of joined many game jams and many uh, design processes before as well. Um, uh, Ville a bit more and also Ville also on the side of the analog games, which is one of the things that we are not analog judgmental in this jam either. So if we want to make a board game or card game or hybrid game or whatever, mm. 
you can also do that. But the design constraint is rather digital. <laughs> yeah. And the examples that we're going to go through. So we have a guest today. Um, let me see. I have to be a studio manager also. So we have a guest who has done quite many games already himself and quite many game jams already. So let's bring Samuli on board. Let's see. Uh, yeah. There we go. Hello, Samuli. Hello. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. <laughs> so finally, finally, you are here with us and, and we are able to kind of uh, hopefully play also the games that we've been uh, putting for this jam and you've been selecting for your design constraint. But so tell a little bit of, about you. Where do you work? What do you do? What kind of games do you create? Yeah, so currently professionally, I do VR headsets at Vario. But whenever I'm not pushing the boundaries of VR industry in the future, I'm jamming little games on my own with friends or alone. And so far, I've attended something like 80 plus game jams. I've made more than 120 video games on my life. Most of them are small little projects, but I've also released a few commercial games on my on my times. Yeah, you, you started jamming in 2012, right? Yes, 2012 Global Game Jam in January was the first jam that I attended. What, what kind of a game did you create it back in that day? Uh, that's uh, uh, quite a funny game. It's actually also playable at the Museum of Finnish Video Game, Video Games in Tampere. And the game uses a Guitar Hero controller and a DDR dance pad. And you need to simultaneously play a shooter game with both of those controllers. And it's very heavily influenced by this kind of like a 70s, 80s disco style. It has a hustle of as the last boss. Right. So, and uh, back in that time, you were studying in Kajaani, right? Yes, I was a student at Kajaani University of Applied Sciences. Yeah, and the game jams were paving your way for all those things that you're doing right now. Or is that correct? Yes, basically, I, the funny thing, I've gotten all the jobs I've gotten in the professional world with the code that and games that I've done for game jams. Wow, that's a huge impact. So no matter what kind of a project you're working on, everything kind of can build up to your portfolio, no matter what it is. Yeah, especially with the VR. I was one of the first guys uh, in our school and in Finland in general who started really experimenting with different kind of VR stuff. So that really paved me a way to be like a professional at VR stuff because there weren't that many people doing it. And the jamming mentabilities menta for a new medium is really good because if you do a lot of small games, you will slowly start uh, figuring out what works and what doesn't. If you just make a one big project and you don't really understand the technology, it's really difficult to start to scale and build the big projects first. Yeah, yeah. So the, the jamming is very much in your uh, DNA of a game maker and experimenter, experimental game creator as well. Uh, can you describe a little bit of what, what are the things that you've tried in game jams? Just to encourage others to also maybe go beyond the web browser only games. Yeah. So first games that I made, most of them were like, actually it was X and A back in the day, which was C Sharp and then slowly Unity. And I used a lot, a lot and a lot of Unity. But at some point I started getting bored of doing only Unity, <laughs> Unity games. So I reached into older platforms like Game Boy and Vectrex and Mega Drive. And I also tried to push the boundaries of my physical limitations as a human being. And I had an amazing trip a couple of years ago in a, in a summer with my friend where we rode through the whole of Sweden from Stockholm to Malmö on a tandem bike where I built a custom computer on the back seat and programmed while cycling 600 kilometers. Yeah, I wish I had a photo, photo to share that. That was quite wild. 
experiment. I've never heard any kind of more experimental jam after that. Did we lose, lose Arko? Uh, Arko, no. No. It seems. I think we, we lost the whole stream. Oh, yeah, are you back? No, no, no. It's just a, it was just yeah. a glitch. So okay. I think that we're back. Yes, yes. So this might happen a lot during this uh, stream. We already had quite a lot of issues. We tested yeah. things on Friday, everything worked. This is the regular uh, story. So you test everything on a certain day. In a couple of days, things are not working. Yeah. But we are assuming also that Discord is having a lot of uh, traffic and we're doing yeah. the, the video chat part through Discord. So we'll hope that Discord will handle this situation and not to kind of uh, let us down. But yeah, anyway, the, the, the jam bike was a crazy experiment and, and, uh, I wish that we could do more of those kind of things. There's a lot of plans of, of weird game jams and, uh, it's not always the, the kind of maybe the need for making the most fancy game in itself in a game jam, but just to kind of push your limits in different kinds of ways. Uh, creatively speaking, so yeah, and in different ways that you are comfortable with. Like for me, it's usually like trying different technologies. So it's not only VR, for example. There was a few years ago a neuro jam where we actually made games controlled with your own brain with the with the sensors in your head. So that was a quite the crazy way of doing games as well. So it's all all about just like looking around you, what kind of technologies you find, and adapting those to video games, even if they are not traditionally used for video games. Yeah. Well, how about various headsets? Are you doing any games for various things? Uh, can you talk uh, about uh, it? <laughs> I, I can talk. I have I have one here on my table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I'm doing remote work, so obviously I need obviously. a head. Obviously. Yeah. So uh, for Vario. The thing is that the Vario headset actually supports Steam VR. So we have made a Steam VR driver. So all the games that you can run in Steam in VR, you can actually play on our headset. So I'm actually pretty excited of maybe playing a little bit of Half-Life Alyx today when it launches. Nice. Uh, yeah. How much yeah. is the difference like when you port it for, for all the VR and then can it actually use all the fancy stuff from Vario? Uh, it actually cannot. So yeah. the way we use the driver, uh, uh, it, in theory, it can use all the power, but in practice, because of the driver limitations, you are you are losing so much performance that there is no uh, computer in this world that could run it maximized. Unlike right. if you are creating a game or software that is using our native plugin, then you can get the full full performance. Uh, out of it. And I've done a couple of like small game like projects that are using our native plugin as well. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, in the last, uh, what is the, the big, biggest hackathon? Ludum Dare. No, no, the biggest, biggest hackathon. The one in Finland. Junction. Junction. Yes, Junction. Sorry. <laughs> We're having a blank here. But in Junction, we actually made a game for the Vario headset with a couple of guys from Vario as well. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, well, we don't have an access to Vario, most of us, of course, but maybe we will have a game jam at the Altos premises next spring with a with couple of headsets. We were kind, kind of already planning for that sort of a possibility, but then, well, it's not really a great match in general to have this season with flu and yeah, um, no. to have the headsets. But we will get there. The world will be uh, different in next spring. But anyway, so um, thanks for joining, Samuli. And we're looking forward to the design constraint that you have picked. And uh, the, this is a little bit maybe different uh, jam that I have been used to and maybe all of us have been used to. So we don't have Definitely. a thematic constraint, but we will have a design constraint. Design uh, constraint is a thing that um, you build your process on. And uh, it is uh, for us, it, there's this one design feature to look at, but we are providing a lot of examples picked by Samoli that how it could be interpreted and what kind of things happens in existing games. So hopefully this is entertaining for those of you also who might not be jamming with us for this week. 
And yeah. I promise to you that this constraint can be implemented in a very easy way, but also we can add ambition level on top of that, depending on what you want to do. Should we go to the constraint or should we yeah. just lay out a couple of other things before? Ville, do you remember if I forgot something to say? Uh, maybe we could uh, say something about the whole structure of this jam. Like uh, we have another show coming up next Monday after the jam has closed on Sunday. So next Monday we will play all the games you have created during this week and discuss them about them with Samuli. Yes, so that we are coming back in a week with the freshly baked games and then we will go through them and enjoy what you have created. So that's going to be exciting for us too. Yeah. Um, yeah, and to add that, obviously, like if some people are doing board games or using some weird things, just record a video for us so we yeah. can comment on that. Yeah, we... For the, due to the, all the possible technical difficulties there, that there might be, all the submission have a required field of a gameplay video. This is also some of the kind of standard things that we try to push. Me and Villa, we also represent the Finnish Game Jam organization and all the jams that we run, we've actually required a Game Jam video. Uh, game Jam games are typically so that it's, it's hard for people to grasp what you made because they are not fully polished with the, the game flow from the first steps and what nuts and the descriptions and so on and so forth. So it's always important to create a short video to ar archive the gameplay, whether it is like just a browser game, but well, they can be easily uh, then lost at some point. So it's good to have a um, also non-interactable uh, version of your game stored somewhere. Yeah. And when you want to show your project to someone else, the video is really handy for that. So take yeah. it as a kind of a part of your jamming practice in general to create a video. It doesn't have to be fancy. Actually, it's better if it's just a pure gameplay so that you can kind of show what the game is about and not to have like a trailer mode of your game because it can be confusing. And specifically important, as Samuli said, for games that uses something that we cannot recreate or someone else can't create recreate so that said also the the duration of the jam is there is up until was it sunday um at what time do you really remember uh i think it was five at sunday five at some sunday finish time so yeah, um evening, yeah. there is time for you to upload your games but you can decide what kind of a jam you do during this week so if you don't, if you have minimum time for this week, consider also trying a one hour jam. So you can, yeah. you can definitely, we've tested so many times. You can create a, you can create a jam game in an hour, but we'll see how it works with the design constraint in itself. So it can be quite challenging yeah. for, for yeah. this. There, but there yeah. are simple, simple tools for that, like beats or something like that. So. Very, so, very easy to do. Yeah, I wonder if people in the chat, uh, <laughs> if you, if you want to guess what the design constraint is, we could do a little bit of a game, yeah. game of that. Yeah. If somebody is brave enough to shout in the chat that, what it must be, what it could be. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. I think it's also <laughs> also important to mention that as we are researchers, we are doing a, a study as well. Yeah. Nobody this, is uh, now recorded, but we'll send a survey that you can participate yeah. to. Yeah. So we ask if you ask for you to participate in this short survey study at the end of the jam. Yeah. Kala91 is guessing that if something spreads, that would be quite nice, though. <laughs> quite timely, but you could interpret it also in a way that it's not so timely. Isolation. Yeah. I, we've seen a lot of. Um, Jams coming up with these th topics as well. Um, Which is actually is pretty fun because I've been in the isolation game jam in Iceland yeah. last summer. Yeah, I noticed just, that there uh, was someone using nice. the isolation in a little bit different way. So it's not the Icelandic version of it, but there is at least one isolation jam in each IO that I spot. 
Yeah. That it means something else. But but the thing is that I we, we can tease a bit more. It's not going to be about COVID. Mm. But let's see, maybe some of your games will be about the topical thing happening right now because it's not it's not incompatible with the, the yeah. topic of virus. Okay, there is a question. Um, let's see, I got thrown off when you guys mentioned board games. I had no idea you could make a board game in a game jam. Yeah, we typically are uh, platform uh, agnostic. So whatever we encourage people to do in the Finnish uh, game jam communities, always analog is invited. It can be a bit difficult if there is, if it's technically oriented, for instance, the the neuro jam. I don't know how well you could have done a hybrid board <laughs> game. Maybe you can create mind control. Yeah board game it's not it's not that impo- impossible but without any technology quite difficult uh the yeah. theme more uh no walls fast paced uh page to do digital version of yep yeah sure you can it's a game controller only one button all right there's a lot of guesses nobody got it right exactly but some of them are close so maybe I will get the screen ready and and are you ready, Samuli, to start talking about what is the design constraint? Yes. So okay. just shoot it. Yes, shoot it. There we have it's on the screen. Go ahead. I'm waiting for the for the stream for myself to also show uh, it in the You Twitch. can't remember it yourself. <laughs> uh, I just want to double check that everything is fine there. Okay, so it will it is minimal instructions, and the idea is to make a game that doesn't blatantly explain how to play it. So it has some elements that are explained uh, indirectly to the player, or in in some cases you could make a game which is completely uh, uh, void of or any kind of tutorials. And it just basically explains itself while you play it. Uh, it's this is all about like interpolating how much of a help you want to give to the give to the player. So uh, as we are going to play through a lot of examples, you will see uh, different ways that game developers have approached the way of teaching the player to play the game. That's perfect. Uh... So the way that we've laid down the examples is that uh, somebody has created categories and uh, which one is the one that we want to do? We start with the number one, which is, yeah. Yeah. let's see, just wait a second. It is coming up to your screens right now. So it is tutorial in controller. And just let me know wh- what is the game that we want to talk about first. I think it is <coughs> just an image now. Yeah. So uh, do you have the image of the arcade cabinet there? I should have it. Just I'll I'll put it in a short moment. Yes. But just go ahead and explain the category. Yeah, I will start explaining. Okay. So idea here is the games where the input method itself. So if you are looking a normal controller here, it's very complex and weird thing. So back in the day, uh, when video games weren't as familiar to uh, people, many of the games used some some kind of like abstraction as a, as a controller. Uh, but many many games that were very popular in arcades actually tailor made a controller for a game, and this way. Uh, you can directly know how to play the game when you see the controller. So in this example that we have here, Marble Madness, uh, it's an old Atari arcade game. The player is controlling a ball. And whenever you are rolling this ball controller, the ball is rolling in the game. Uh, I will change the, my, my image to the game soon. So we can play it a little bit. So 
So let's see if the, the game in itself works in our uh, text setting here in Twitch. But um, should be able to show you a little bit of the gameplay. Uh, yes. Wait a second. Doesn't. Okay. Keyboard word noises coming up. Yes, it's right here. Too bad we didn't have the actual cabinet, so we could have played that. Yeah, actually, the, the scrolly dungeon in Tampere has the cabinet. I played it there. Oh, nice. Should have went there and take a picture. <laughs> we still have yeah. your face, but the, the, the screen is coming up soon. Yes, so now we should have the have the game here. There we go. Let's see. So I will I will put some put some coins in. Yeah. And this is a game that I used to play as a very 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 young young kid. So my first game console ever was Master System from Sega. And that one uh, actually had a few games from my cousins. I got it as a, as a present from my cousins when they got the newer newer uh, game console. And I played this a lot, a lot without the ball controller itself. So when I was able to play it with the actual ball controller, it was actually a lot easier. So here with the emulator, I'm playing with the keyboard and mouse. So with the arrow keys, it's a little bit more difficult to actually control this game as well. But you can imagine how easy it's to understand how to play this game because you are physically rolling the ball. Except not with a keyboard. But... Not with a keyboard, eh? <laughs> yeah, no, not I... with a keyboard. It's, it's a little bit. I think that I might have oh, played no! something in my childhood as well, but not exactly this. I don't know. So, which platform was this for? So this was ported back in the day to like all the PCs and all the consoles, yeah. Yeah. but this is originally an arcade game. So yeah, this yeah, is what yeah, I'm yeah. running here is an arcade emulation. Yeah. Right. Now, I wonder if it's actually based on this physical uh, analog version where you turn this uh, level of this node. Yeah, I haven't opened the arcade machine, so I don't really yeah. know how it physically yeah, but, works. Yeah, but I, I mean, like the it has been inspired by this, like uh, analog. I don't know what what it's actually called. The game with area free yeah. ball and everything. All I know about the development of this game is that there is actually a GDC talk about the history of hey. making this back in the day. <laughs> where they go a little bit more in depth, but they don't really go into the controller there. They are yeah. mostly talking about ray tracing, because this is first baked ray traced game ever. <laughs> Samuli, can you, can you lower a little bit of your game uh, audio so that we can hear better in this room? Unfortunately, I can't control okay. the audio, audio in this emulator, so... All right, so we'll be... I will go back to the image. Okay, let, yeah. let's go there. Uh, yeah. So cool. Um, so I, the thing that came to my <coughs> mind is this uh, physical toy by Brio and others, where you have the box, like wooden box, and you turn yeah, the things. Uh, must be in, yeah. kind of inspired by marble, marble madness. Must be inspired by that kind of kids' uh, toy as well. Yeah, it, it could be, and that's also very like when you. That's actually basically a physical version of this. Like you have those two knobs. You know, notice those knobs. You turn them. Okay, now now you understand how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have other games that are example for this? Uh, I'm not opening any games, but other games that are inspired could, could be like treated in this category of professional dancing games. So they have the pad with four buttons, which is basically just a long, uh, quick time event that you play, or yeah. old school light gun games. So you just have a gun and a trigger, and you point it. How about all the Wii games? So, the games where you are using your own uh, body as a controller, I treat I would treat them a little bit separate because if if I give someone a Wii mode, they don't really know what to do with the Wii mode. Whereas with the Marble Madness controller, they know that okay, it's a ball, I can rotate it. 
so they can start to understand how the game plays even before they see the game. Yeah. But With that... the motion controller <laughs> games, you usually have to boot up the game before you start understanding what do you, what do you need to do. Yeah, but during the the kind of the high heydays of Wii, there was a lot of peripherals and a lot of like talk of so-called mimetic interfaces where you mimic the. So yeah, like uh, well, also also at the same time like Guitar Heroes and and yeah. uh, all the band stuff that was happening. Yeah. So a lot of peripherals. With the, with the... Yeah, there's a lot of that. With Guitar Hero and also racing games, they have like this kind of very familiar controller to some people. But uh, the musical instruments or cars are not as universally understood as a ball that you can speak. Yeah. You but can then speak. Again, yeah. It, then again, it, Guitar Hero, you don't play it like real guitar, but but kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of, in a sense. Like it's it is like it is in the same category, but I would consider it more difficult to approach mm. uh, than a dancing game or a, or a marble game. But it's not far. It's not far off. How about if you create a game where, where you have like just a tip, like a typical like a Microsoft controller or something, and the game itself happens in the, what you see in the screen, there is the controller as well. Yeah, there's actually one game, uh, keyboard sports that actually maps the whole keyboard into the screen, that could actually work in this sense really well, because then every key is mapped into the screen one-to-one. -one. Yeah. And I also done one uh, Game Jam game that was also in Junction, but it was like three years ago, where I used the Steam controller, which has this kind of haptic feedback for your thumb, and I used it not also as an input, but also output. So the player was in a deep uh, maze where he couldn't see around, but you could actually feel with your thumb from the controller uh, the walls around you and the shapes shapes that were around there. And one funny thing with the haptic feedback was that I was able to do different haptic feedbacks depending on is it a wall or is it, for example, a lava pool. So you would feel a boiling, boiling uh, floor under your under your thumb uh, if there was like a, some kind of danger, and if it was just a solid, solid rumble if it was a wall. Yeah, is it difficult for someone that just uh, cooks up with their jam games to use like rumble? Isn't it should be quite easy, right? It is. It is easy. Yeah. yeah. So you you don't need this kind of fancy control that you could just place the controller rumble. Yeah. All right, uh, one uh, chat message, uh, Quop. What do we think about Quop in terms of fitting into this category? So uh, Quop, in a sense, uh, it goes more into the, into the keyboard sports in a way that you need to see the screen. So Quop is controlled with the keyboard. And if you just give a, give a keyboard to someone, uh, they don't understand how to play the game. So yeah. uh, this, this was more about that what the control tells you about the game more than what the game introduces you to the controller. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Should we go to the next uh, category um, of, yes. the, of the constraint? Yeah, we can continue. Uh, yeah. So let me see if I can handle this. I will take the image away and wait, wait, wait. Dun, dun, dun. And the second constraint is prologue as tutorial. What do we have as an example? Or do you want to explain first? Yeah, I can explain while I while I launch the launch the game. So this is something that is very popular nowadays. It started to become popular at the uh, SNES days and then with PlayStation 2, but now a lot of games do this. So they have this like uh, certain section of the game that teaches you the basic mechanics before you are thrown into the proper story of the game. So it works both as a storytelling goal and then as a, as a section of gameplay to slowly start to understand how to, how to play the game. And as an example here, uh, I will show Demon's Souls, which has a really short prologue, so it's quite fast to show here. Yeah, let's hope that everything works. 
so the way that we're sharing um, Samuli's uh, gameplay is a screen share to through Discord, and that was quite glitchy before this. So we'll see. <laughs> And you, you, yeah. the game doesn't have to be 2D, 3D, anything. There's that's freedom is there, and you don't have to have access to hardware or controllers. The things can be played on keyboard. You'll see there there will be more categories for you to tap into. Yeah, and all of these categories you don't need to pick and choose one. These are just examples. So the best games actually combine multiple one of these together. I need to... So what we're talking about with uh, Samuli is that, well, in some of the typical games, there is a tutorial part separately, but this King is... Island, the 12th. Yeah, I will skip the... <laughs> Let's skip that. But we skip, will... Skip the, skip the all the, all the cutscenes, because I can't change the volume of the game until I'm here. So, so minimal instructions in diff many different ways. And a lot of the Game Jam games, they don't have a lot of instructions. Maybe not at all in, in itself. But this time, try to think about it specifically, how your game actually nails the minimal instruction in a good design way. Yeah. So, uh, oh, I need to... So with the with Demon Souls, it doesn't explain everything to you, and it's actually not super good at explaining things. But how it explains is very well uh, tied tied into the whole loop and the prologue. So you have these messages that uh, just show you the controls, and then you can try them out on your own. And then they give you the first enemy that you can try try all the all the buttons that you learned learned into and this is very very basic to like to uh to a common like a new triple a game nowadays And here you can see uh, ghosts of other players. There's another category where I will talk a little bit more about those as well. So some of the games that are like from the history that are really uh, famous for the prologue starting sections. Uh, I think uh, Mega Man X was one of the first games do it like really well uh, it set up the story and the uh, aspirations of the player really well while teaching all the all the mechanics that they needed to understand the game and then uh, at the launch of PlayStation 2 there was uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 that actually used the uh, prologue as a way of not only teaching the player but teasing the whole game but they also tease it into like a different direction from the like uh, from the full release. So what they did, they uh, released the prologue as a as a separate demo where people could play the game as much as they wanted. And when the final release came, it had like this kind of very uh, big twist of like how you play the game and who you play the game as. But all the mechanics that you learned in the demo didn't go in vain, and you were able to use them in the in the final game as well. Yeah, and back in the days, like th these things were huge when the previous steps were giving you manual to learn the game from, for instance, or that they were separate, yeah. like tutorial screen or something like that. Yeah. So so. This prologue started to like a lot give you a way of like getting into the game without reading the manual. 
I can actually show you in between the games. I have some really, really, really old games here that have really weird manuals if you read them from nowadays because they are from 80s. Yeah. So the, I think that this has been like one of the kind of design values of the industry for a long time to improve the tutorial, make it more transparent and part of the part of the games. Part of the game and not only the game directly, but it's a good way of like separating it uh, from the other content is doing the prologue. Because many yeah. games, when you are doing a second or third uh, playthrough of the game, you can often disable the like skip the whole whole prologue. Yeah. So it's it's not a separate section in the options. You have to play it in the first time. But after that you can play it better. In a, in a way that it can be also annoying if you're very used to a certain genre or something. Yeah, it's also interesting like considering the structure like uh, maybe getting inspiration from movies and everything where you you can also in this intro part uh, represent the car present the characters and everything at the same time as you teach on the play. yeah and there's like also it. some games like uh i think it's java gomori i think was 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 it that is like a horror game and when you play the tutorial first time, uh, it teaches you just how to push blocks. And next will be like a very major spoiler for the game. So spoiler alert for Java Gomori, if no one, someone wants to play it, don't listen to me. <laughs> uh, the game also ends to the same room as the tutorial. Wow. Uh, and in that game, the prologue was actually, when you play it again, you understand that what you were doing in the tutorial was a setup for a suicide of the main character that you were playing as. So it's very eerie that at the end of the game you do the exactly same things that you did at the beginning, but mm. now they are recontextualized to a different thing. So the prologue is also an epilogue. Right. Uh, interesting. So you can also use it as a as a repeating element. By the way, you are stopping everyone in the back. <laughs> is that like intentional or? Yeah, it's intentional. It's just if, like a if mean, I do mean it. like that. It's yeah. it's faster to faster to kill them and just like go into yeah. rust to the rust yeah. to the end of the. Yeah, they're very good fighters when they they are just throwing <laughs> their back to you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that we. And this is this is that, one of the one. interesting interesting parts of the Demon Souls tutorial, is that it has a like a really big like reputation of a really difficult game. So it shows you that the first boss that you face in the face yeah. in the uh, in the game really like kicks your ass. You can in theory yeah. beat it, but uh, this way uh, it also like undermines your like. Okay, you are now ready to play the game, but you are not like ready enough. <laughs> so you yeah. need to still learn learn a little bit of uh, playing yourself be yeah, and be careful. Also interesting when I was playing the new Star Wars games and. You also encounter this big monster there and first try to fight it, but it's very hard. So it kind of like introduces to you that you can travel around and gather more experience and come back later. Yeah, Mega Man X actually does exactly the same thing. But instead of letting you die, it actually shows you another character who comes at fully powered up and beats the boss. So it shows you that Later, you will also be able to be, the, be this powerful, but now you are still this like uh, uh, little noob that needs to learn more. Yeah. From the but chat, think... there there are a couple of uh, kind of uh, lifts uh, of games. So there's Portal and then Titanfall too. So yeah. You... Yes. So Portal we will actually play later. Yeah. And Titanfall two, I really agree with the tutorial. It is actually a really really good tutorial. And what I like about the Portal. Uh, the, the, the Titanfall 2's tutorial is that once you beat into tutorial, it actually challenges you to like beat it faster. So you can, in that place, start gaining a little bit more skill if you weren't as confident. Or if you are playing with the harder difficulty, you can really nail down the mechanics of the game. So when I was playing Titanfall myself, I actually spent a lot of time 
in the tutorial after beating it, to replaying the challenge part of it, to get better with the core mechanics before going into yeah. the game proper. Yeah. My, my favorite example, which is not really part of this category, but is still, I could still argue a little bit that the Tomb Raider, I don't, I don't remember which one of them, but where the Lara Croft's mansion has one room for training. Maybe it's actually in a couple of, the, uh, of it, them. It's, it's in multiple of the games, yes. Yeah, so it still ties into the story when you go and you practice in the, in the kind of a training room or training area and you can go back and forth like you can imagine that the story goes like that you go back to the mansion and you train a bit more so it's, yeah. it's kind so I think of the, interesting the main yeah. main point with the tomb prior that like is different from all of these examples is that it's a different menu option mm. so if you're playing the game first time you even may miss it because you deliberately need to select the tutorial to start yeah. okay. and nowadays yeah. games really don't do that you would, could, could always, always, almost, there's, there's a mistake of not offering the tutorial to the player. Yeah. So <laughs> nowadays it's usually like uh, you have the prologue as a tutorial and it's mandatory to play through to get learn of the mechanics. Yeah. It would be really beneficial for anyone who plays the Tomb Raider to play the tutorial, even though it doesn't prompt it. Yeah. But should we go should for we the go next forward? one? Yeah. Yes. So we could actually go to the to the uh, by other players thing because I can tie it back to this a little bit better. So uh, that would be is that number three or is that? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, that's number four. So that's tutorial yeah, by other players. Uh, so yeah, that one. Here we go. Yes. Yeah. So the tutorial by other players. Uh, is a category. Oh, I need to put my camera on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, right. it's, it's a category where the other players are helping you to understand the game. And there's a lot of games like MMOs and other games where you need to read wikis and ask from other players online how to how to understand the game. But some games are trying to uh, prompt other players to help you to play the game without being so verbose and vocal and uh, difficult to understand. And what, so, what kind of a game do we have as an example? So as an example, we have Journey here. Mm -hmm. So I will I will boot it up and I will briefly talk a little bit about Demon Souls while that game is booting up. Because Demon Souls also has this tutorial by other players. So you were able to see those little tutorial messages that I was reading. In Demon Souls, they are not only uh, left by the developers, the similar messages are also left by the other players. And when you play the game Fooder, uh, it's half puzzle game and half action games, especially the Demon Souls, the first game they made uh, in that series. Uh, there was a lot of parts where you had to read what other players left you as a hint to proceed in the game, because it was basically a mystery that the community was trying to decipher together. Yeah. But instead of going into wikis, you were able to read these little blurbs of messages on the ground from other players. Obviously, some players were helpful. Some some uh, players were also leaving malicing tips. So mm. it wasn't always a good tip to follow. Yeah. So uh, you need to be a little bit of like a, use a common sense of not to jump into every every pitfall in the game. But I found it really interesting way of like communicating between players because you were able to leave messages to other players that they would find later and help help each other and you would also uh, as a person who leaves the messages you actually were able to go and check how much people were voting them up or down so it was encouraging to leave positive messages yeah. so the developers only left the minimum tutorial and left rest of the tutorial to the community to drop the world yeah, very interesting approach and in interesting way to bring the community into the game. Yeah, I'm just wondering how would you do that in a jam game in a short time? Like, how do you, like, how would you, is that even possible? Uh, it is definitely possible. It's it's difficult. To... Specifically when the jam games don't necessarily have like a huge audience that would gather these comments too. Yeah, but in in Journey we will see this kind of similar thing with just two players. 
So that is a, a little bit more champ friendly. <laughs> but obviously it would then still require a little bit of uh, networking if you would go with this way. But you could definitely do something similar with the local local uh, multiplayer game mm -hmm. where you, for example, would have a two player game where only one player always leaves and the other player will play a new game with the, someone else. So for example, player one is always the new player and player two has played the game. And then when player two leaves, player one becomes player two and then you would get a new player one. And the player two will be the mentor of the game for the next player. Mm. This is actually uh, how you often learn board games in the real life. You have one guy in the group teaching you the rules instead of reading them because that's more interactive and entertaining. Yeah, I was also wondering the um, what is this? Uh, the, 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 um, oh my god, I can't remember the name of the game, but there are the the apes. <laughs> is it the King Kong or what is it called? But a game where you can play um, an adult um, monkey or a tiny monkey, uh, the child monkey. And in a way, there are some of these games that kind of um, gives the handicap possibility to play with different age groups, for instance. And then by leading with an example by an actual co-player on the couch, you could also learn the gameplay. Yeah, yes, or even have like a separate role for the another player that is easier to do than the main player's yeah. role. Yes, Donkey Kong Some of the... Jungle, Donkey Kong something, Donkey Kong. Yeah, but it's Donkey Kong, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and then the the Rayman games have a player, and then some of the Mario games let you to play as a cloud as well. Yeah, yeah. So how the journey works is that you start alone uh, and while you play the game, uh, other people will join your session and go away from your session. So there is no NPCs. So if we see an another player, it's an another player. And the game is completely playable uh, from beginning to end alone, but it has a lot of secrets, good vis uh, great vistas, achievements, interesting places, and things that you can and most likely will miss in your first playthrough. And when you are playing with other, other players online, they usually guide you to different places, and they guide you to uh, different ways. And the length of the scarf, you can see the little scarf in my character, will actually show how uh, basically good the player is in the game. And later you will actually get different colored capes as well. We can see some uh, other tutorial uh, kind of a gambits there as well, that there is a controller image right in yes, the top and, of the screen. and just the highlighting of the one button you need to mm. press. Mm. And that's one of the also like uh, interesting things that you can easily do for a jam game that you you have an image that you don't have a text that explains that what button to push but you would have an image of the controller or keyboard or something like mm. that to give a better lead so uh, unlike your usual uh, multiplayer game with the journey, you can't actually directly communicate with the, with the other player. So you can only jump and do these little chirps. And you can do like quick chirps or long chirps or a mixture of them. And often when you play with different uh, people, they chirp differently. And you will like uh, create a new language between two players with these chirps. And it was actually very interesting for me when I played Journey for the first time. I actually got a player with me who had the maximum uh, scarf, basically, in the game. Mm. So they are called white scarves. 
and they showed me 100% completion of the game on my first playthrough. Cool. Which was at the same time a little bit. Uh, it's actually now showing space to me as a, I changed to the keyboard and mouse to play. So that, that's why there was a bar, it was a space bar. So it was interesting to me because I had a friend with me who had played the game something like 20 or 30 times. And half of the places that White Scarf took me were something that she didn't know existed in the game. Mm. And uh, for me, it was really interesting because the game was really long for me. Because it's usually a few hours, but I played it for like maybe six hours or something. Because the another, play another player was really patient with me of like waiting for me to always find the places. And if I almost missed something, they stopped and re-guided me back to the different paths of different wonders that, that I was able to find in the game. Yeah, very interesting experience. And also the thing that the other player also wanted to play that many hours. And Yeah, and the players who do that, they are regularly just online helping other yeah. people to find different places. So it's very yeah. like... Uh, very interesting, like how different experiences you can have. Like for someone that might be mm -hmm. some of the be best experience in the game that you can help some anonymous people you don't know. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the scholarly side, it's called social capital. So you have something to give for the others, showing how the game is played. And I think that this is very nicely done with the... With, with a kind of a friendly community. I don't know how vicious the players, maybe the, there is also a possibility that they lead you astray. Uh, there, there is actually yeah. like uh, how that game company made this game. They made it really uh, not troll friendly. Yeah. So you can't really die in the game or go into bad positions and you never need the another player to yeah. proceed. So yeah. They made it in a way that it's always welcoming for the new players. So I think there's someone waiting us. So now I'm in the part where I can actually get another player. But like a, considering gaming capital, that is also interesting because like a, you don't nobody sees that you've been helping. So mm -hmm. it's like in that sense, it's more altruistic to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit that uh, reminds story. me like how you go something. It's not exactly in this category, but something that just popped into my head was the one like uh, a letter writing game where you would write letters to anonymous uh, people and you would never know who got the letter and how they replied to it. Yeah, so some people are just uh, using their own free time to make this like very nice letters to yeah. other people around the world that would make them uh, feel happy. So and it's like they, a, they, they like haven't a modern really had any message in the bottle. Yeah, modern message in the bottle, and they really don't have trouble with the trolls because the trolls never know if anyone read the message or not, mm. and they don't see the reaction. Yeah, the troll-free design is just uh, it's. It's pure professionalism. It, it, yeah. In my head, it just makes makes hours and hours of work of thinking about it. You scar. Should we go to the next category? Yes. Yeah, yeah it, I was just it about. Looks like there is no another player currently online because that's the uh, downside of this game is that if we don't get the another player, we don't see the communication with it, and it's an old game, so it's no wonder yeah. there is no one online currently. But it's very beautiful. Yes. Simple and, and be beautiful graphics. And we already saw a couple of other Atmosphere. things also for for that, uh, for for making tutorials or minimum minimum instructional uh, minimal instructions. So yes, the whole ways. whole game whole game is like extremely extremely minimal. Yeah. So. So what do we pick yeah. next? The uh, the number the three then. What? Yeah, the one we one we skipped. Let's go yeah. that. So that level design as tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. And, some and what is it? game there? And this is one of the more classic topics. So for the classic topic, I picked a very classic game as well. Yeah. So level design as as tutorial, and I will open us. 
So what, what, which game are we talking about? Uh, uh, Super Mario Brothers. Ah, <laughs> of course. Uh -huh. <laughs> I just need to load up the game. And level design is one of the uh, easiest and fastest ways, maybe, with the champ games. Yeah. Especially yeah. uh, to help people play. So just give players like uh, piece, pieces of the game one by one. And it's very uh, much kind of used also in free to play games that you gradually build the complexity of the. Or games of the and level, levels, yes. <gasps> so, for instance, if you think about Candy Crush. And there are different features. Did did we did we disagree on this? But the Candy Crush uh, saga, where you get like more features and more features the further you go with levels. Yeah, we we disagreed on a different thing. That thing okay. I totally agree with yeah. you is that uh, it is the like different levels give you different challenges. Yeah, and it's a great way to kind of make it also so that it doesn't annoy the players too much to experience players so they, they can they can also enjoy the simple levels first and then go forward with the with more features coming up yeah okay so the game game should be should be live yeah. now yeah i have to resize it a bit i can't a duck hunt as well yeah this is the the classic multi rom yeah a I... duck hunt was also like a example of the the first category as a when you have yeah as a, as a light weapon. light gun game yes yeah yeah so okay. let's go here and i will go really slowly because the main meat of the of the super mario is at the beginning of the game and the first level is what they iterated most on and one tip that many many game developers did back in the day and still do today is that the beginning of the game the parts where you teach the game are actually the things that you do last mm -hmm. in the game, because then you know what the rest of the game uh, requires from the player. So Mario, back in the day, uh, people weren't used to playing uh, any side-scrolling games. Oh, why is this not working? Maybe you have to activate the window somehow. It is active. I think it forgot my input. <laughs> Sorry, I, I need to... Also, I like how, the... how in Mario games they, they made such a kind of a huge job in in kind of a polishing the game feel so that the jumping would feel optimally nice. So yes. the simple things that you see in the game were not a result of few hours, but a lot of hours of design. Yes, because the, the game they previously made, the, the Donkey Kong, uh, it actually had like fixed jump. So when you press jump button, it made this fixed arc. So you couldn't control the jump. But, so they decided that let's make like a better feeling jump. And a jump that is also higher than the player. That was actually uncommon back in the day. Mm. It was a new thing that you can jump higher than the player because it's not realistic, but it's a video game. It doesn't need to be realistic. Yeah. Uh, but here, like for uh, someone who is now playing this first time back in the day, it's like getting used to the jumping and not really understand how the game works. The first thing that they got is this weird thing that comes at them and they most likely die. Mm. Mm. So, so the you next will instantly time... know that that's, that's something that you die for. Yeah. yeah, that's something that you die for. You you learn from the experience. And the thing that you can do is jump, basically. The two buttons in the controller do running and jumping. So you can jump uh, above the first first enemy. And you uh, basically beat a new first challenge in the, in the game. So now that the designers are comfortable for you, like you, can, you know how to control this character. You can now proceed into the game. They will give you something interesting, this flashing. blinking, flashing, flashing like uh, boxes that actually consume uh, like uh, a little bit more resources than you would maybe think. And by jumping at them, you are using the same action that you learned. Uh, you get the coin. 
And now we get to the, the most interesting part is that, okay, we have more of these question mark blocks here. So let's uh, hit one of them. And oh no, I'm getting uh, this mushroom thing again. Maybe this one is an enemy. I jump over it. But because they have a ceiling, mm -hmm. you can't jump over it. <laughs> you have to hit the mushroom. And then you notice that, oh, it, the mushroom was good. Yeah. So now I have this more powerful, more stronger, better Mario. And yeah, and now you realize you can break those tiles when you're yeah. bigger. Yeah, when, when you are jumping around. And getting yeah. bigger is also like really rewarding. So the beginning yeah. of the game, you start from this like a puny little tiny man and then you grow yeah. up and now you are stronger and you are uh, yeah. ready to face the face the dangers of the world. Yeah. So I think like the, the first screen of the Mario is like very well thought out and designed, even though it well, it is a really, really old game. Mm. I, I wonder where does the where does the first kind of um uh, squat comes in? And going into the tube. Is it already these two tubes? No. Uh, was it the second one or? What do you mean? I oh. mean that how do they, uh, when do they teach the squatting, the, the going down with the character? Uh, this one, that you could yeah. go down into the pipes. They actually yeah. do not teach that. They don't really teach many e other things here. Everything, yeah. But yeah, but that's because, a good note to not to maybe teach every single piece so that there yeah, is a replayability. Yeah, and those are not uh, something that you need to do to advance. They are yeah. secrets. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to teach the secrets to the to the player. Yeah. yeah. And I can show you this was one another part that I don't think they really did very good well like tutorializing, but these bits here. Oh, I run out of time. <laughs> if you are the small Mario in those pits, they are safe pits to fall to, but you can't actually jump out of them mm. as, a, as a small Mario. So if I go go back... I'm so used to playing this with the Nintendo that the input lag on the PC is difficult. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> so from here, you can actually jump away from here, but there's, there were some parts where you actually can't jump in this level as well. Uh -huh. Where you actually have to hold the run button. Oh, it's a bit more button. difficult at least, yeah. Yeah, because you need to understand that if you hold the run button, you jump more. Mm. There also maybe comes the gaming capital slash social, social capital that back in the day, a lot of people, us kids, we were playing them with uh, other kids. So I, I wonder if the guys from the Nintendo were purposefully also kind of thinking about that, that others can teach. Yeah, the the secrets, especially like that you can skip the levels and other things yeah. like yeah. that. But many secrets back in the day, for example, the level skip in Mario, they are actually left over from development. Yeah. Because they were just used as a shortcut to try different worlds. Right. <laughs> All right, good. Yeah. Did we have another game for this? Should we go forward with uh, the yes. next category? Yes, so... Tutorial. Yes, I, I will put on the light. It's beginning to be dark here. <laughs> yeah, the darkness came. The, you're disappearing in the darkness. Yeah, we have several categories still to go on. Yes, so let's go to the the tutorial as as world building. Okay. Yeah. Let me get it for you. So many many games. Uh, use the tutorial in the same way as in the in the prologue as tutorial. They use the uh, tutorial itself to teach more of the game to you. And which game do we put on? So I'm showing here uh, Myst, <laughs> and I'm actually more specifically showing you Riven, which is actually the sequel to Myst. Myst 2. It's not Myst 2, it's Riven. They uh -huh. did call it Myst 2. I don't think we have a picture for it. It's coming up now. Okay. So, and the, it was really missed opportunity of calling it Myst 2. But it's called well, Riven, the sequel to Myst. <laughs> I have never actually, I bought the Myst uh, package, but this could still be the picture of the what you're talking about. Yeah. So let's skip, skip all the things. 
So Myst is uh, it uses a lot of like FMVs and environments uh, to guide the player through. There's a great deal of history that you should know. But I'm afraid that I must continue my writing. So the first th thing that actually the uh, guy here tells you is that there's a lot of history you need to know. Most of what you'll need to know is in there. And it gives you a guide. Keep it well hidden. That looks like the actor from uh, Gladiator. What was his name? <laughs> For reasons you'll discover, I can't send you to Riven with a way out. But I can give you this. It appears to be a linking book back here to Dunny. But it's actually a one man prison. Yeah. So he's giving you a lot of hints about the world itself. But because Myst is very traditional point and click adventure, uh, the interface itself is actually. I will skip this now. So the interface itself is. Uh, really uh, simple to use. You just need the mouse and you click around. Uh, which actually yes. is not... Russell Crowe. Oh, there's still still someone someone telling me something. Okay, now now I'm in the game. So the first Myst has a little bit faster beginning, but uh, the idea of the Myst is that wherever you show your cursor, you, it, it's exactly showing what, what, what is going to happen when you press it, so you can go to different places. Uh, this was really easy for many people to understand back in the day, and that's why Myst was played by a lot of play, a lot of people and players who weren't traditionally uh, used to playing video games. This this kind of design con uh, kind of um, feature um, is still visible in some casual games, like what Big Fish Games does with the mystery case files. They are very much mist like. Mm. Rendered, yeah, ren render rendered things. Mm. How, how do I exit this? Yeah. And I would say yeah. that this is a. It, it would be nice to see also jam games done in the mist way. Yeah, yeah. And and the reason why uh, I brought especially mist for as a tutorial as world building is that because the gameplay is so simple, uh, the actual thing you need to learn is how the world functions. Mm. So the game has fictional languages, fictional islands, fictional places, fictional history. And the whole game is about learning more about different pieces of that history and go in different places and understanding where you are and what you are supposed to do. And all the Myst games are played in a way that if you understand uh, how they work, so here I'm actually in this uh, some chair and something is happening to me, but I played in a way that if you know how the world functions, you can skip 90% uh, of the content because you know how to learn, the, read the language, you know where to go, you know mm -hmm. the order of things. So they are using uh, the world building to guide the player to different places. So now I I would have to like read the book and. Uh, would actually have to listen a little bit more carefully what the guy was telling me at the beginning. Uh, and these games are a little bit outdated in a way that like uh, some of the things are like really obscure and they take a lot of time to figure out. So most games are actually best played with friends. So I played actually this Riven a little bit uh, in my high school days with a friend of mine who also used to play it as a kid. And together, without any guides, we were playing it slowly and understanding different parts of the world and combining our knowledge to slowly get uh, better and uh, uh, deeper into the game. I don't really remember that much from it, but it was a really interesting way of teaching me like new things of this like fictional universe that helped me to go, go around. And also, I think like uh, this kind of game design is a good way to go past the uh, technical limitations with the graphics. You can have a very beautiful game, considering it's 95, when you don't have animations there that much. And, and I think the time is right to also explore these kind of older techniques, because 
Uh, we're not expecting that everything is um, real-time uh, graphics with a very flashy whatnots, but we might be more interested in the stories that people can tell. Yeah. So another game in this category I want to also show uh, is Witness, which is a lot more recent example, which is very well at like tutorializing and helping the helping the player. So there was actually sorry the chat comment that it required five or six CDs back in the days. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. But they then again, I got, yeah. But uh, then again, people were much more used to actually have this like uh, some late Amiga games. They required like Monkey Island two required. I don't know was the six or twelve discs or whatever. Yeah, they they were. The they were huge a... amount of changing. Yeah, and how the uh, Riven, for example, worked was that every disc is a different island in the world. Yeah. So you can be on that disc for a long mm. time, and then uh, only when you need to change island, you need to change the disc. Yeah, that was very annoying, like playing Ultima 6 or something. And you have different discs for characters and places and everything. So you had to change all the time when they are loading something, and that was a very annoying way of doing it. Yeah, so I'm now opening the Witness to us. So Witness is one of my... Where... I can't select the screen because the Discord is jumping around. Yeah, the Witness is not old game. Yeah, it's it's not an old game. It's one of my like favorite recent... Uh, oh, it defaulted to a controller, no? Yeah. Let's play with the controller then. <laughs> okay, so it's one of my favorite three uh, puzzle game, and it's very heavily inspired by Myst in a way that it's a it's an island where there is uh, logic to play around. But instead of uh, having this like a normal gameplay, you have this language of puzzles. So whereas in Myst you need to learn actual foreign language here you need to learn a rule set of dots and lines mm. Mm. and it gradually opens you uh, different parts of the of the game and the island so now I'm uh, away from the tutorial area basically uh, or the like the first corridor where we make sure that okay I know how to use the controller and then I'm restricted in this small courtyard where I can see I have three cables that I still need to fix. And this is also showing me, okay, if, if there are these kind of like portals and gates and cords, I can always follow them to, to find different things. Hmm. Well, what do we think about uh, gating as a mechanic for, to do with tutorials? Like, I mean, it, it can reduce your, specifically in the 3D uh, environments, it can reduce your possibilities to explore. Yeah, I, I think uh, gating the player is is good uh, if the places where he would go uh, would give him like a really bad uh, experience. So basically reducing the frustration of the player not understanding what to do and how mm. to play the game by mistake helps a lot. yeah yeah so i think uh uh here you can actually see there's like two ways of solving this you can start that corner or the or the another corner but the another corner would go into a dead end so you can't use it mm. so it's slowly telling us that yeah we can actually have multiple entry points in this puzzle yeah but going back to uh, modern games like Zelda Breath of the Wild had uh, had a really good like way of tackling this. It like had this like really big tutorial area where you were able to freely do a lot of things and experience the mechanics. But it restricted you of going uh, to the difficult parts where you would just die mm. before you uh, understand like most of the mechanics. You don't need to understand all the mechanics, but most of the mechanics. And here, following the power lines, I actually notice that 
uh, where is the way? There is the way. But tell that me... there is like multiple yeah. multiple ways of connecting the cable. So now I connected the upper cable. So I and not the not the lower cable. So it activated the another panel in the in the in the another room. I guess if I remember correctly, this it's been a while when I played the beginning of the game. Yeah. But, but t tell me, Samuel, like... I have uh, like yeah. difficulties to understand. Witness as a world building tutorial example. I do understand Mist, but do, are, are you oh, referring yeah. to how how the whole game is about the puzzles, or what what is the the world building part? Yeah. So so thing is that I don't wanna maybe spoil too much, <laughs> but this language of dots and lines. It's not only in these panels. Yeah. It is also in the world itself. Mm -hmm. So in the later parts of the game, uh, you will be tracing rivers and skies and stars mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. different parts of the world. And you actually, if you just play the game normally, you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But it has multiple endings and multiple different ways of how well you understand and in internalize this mechanic and start seeing these patterns in different places. And different areas of this island... Uh, I think the, is the door is not open yet. Because oh, oh, I don't play this further, but if after yeah. this door, uh, I could go anywhere in this island. And all the places basically have different difficulty because they have different puzzles. So there are audio puzzles, there are environmental puzzles, there are shadow puzzles, there are sunlight puzzles, there are mirror puzzles. Uh, all of them are using this basic mechanics, but no matter where you go, because the puzzle types are different, you can actually uh, very well uh, start to solve them, even if you haven't solved all the previous. So I really appreciate how it like teaches you new, new uh parts of the game because you can completely non-linearly solve the game and you can start noticing these patterns earlier or later of the game when you start understanding like how the whole uh, uh, environment is laid up and the whole uh, world is laid up yeah yeah let's go to the next one we we need to yeah. pick up a pace so we, uh... with this it's maybe a little bit difficult to uh explain and understand as a tutorial mm. as world building uh, from this little little peak but it's one of my favorite uh, example of this category when you actually get get further in the game so basically yeah. like the language of the game world itself is gradually opened yeah. up for the player yes and that and that's completely driven by the player's curiosity so yeah. I, I i also like a witness in a sense that like you can actually stop the game in multiple different parts and then you can come back and try to search for more things. Hmm. They deliberately only put two Steam achievements into the game yeah. uh, for people to like notice that, okay, if you played the game normally through, you might have noticed that you didn't get any achievements. Hmm. Yeah. So and you then, have to then, play you, it again. then you maybe think, okay, maybe there is something more in this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, so the next one would be t tutorial in tech showcase. <laughs> we lost Samuli. No, yeah, Samuli's I put yeah. some more lights on because it seems to still be dark. <laughs> so the <laughs> tutorial in t tech showcase. So l let us hear what is that all about. Yeah. So this is a oddball uh, category that when I was thinking different games and different tutorials, this is a. There was used to be a time and place for these kind of things where the game engine features were a big thing. Like you wanted to show different things to do in game. And because you were showing different ways of how the game engine and the technology worked, you were also showing the player different ways of interacting with the, with the world. Mm -hmm. So the game that we are showing here is Quake, which was basically the first full 3D FPS that had a lot of new tech that people weren't used to. And if Wille, Wille starts, starts yeah. playing the game, uh, I, will, I can slowly pinpoint a few things. One, one of funny fun historical quake is actually it didn't default to WASD and mouse because it was 
considered too advanced for people to know how to use. <laughs> the so, <clock. laughs> yeah, like Finns would so, say. <laughs> you can first select the difficulty and then go to the first level at the at left. Yeah, that was the. Yeah, no, no just go there. Just go yeah. there. And then go left. That's the yeah. first. That's the first chapter here. Yeah. So uh, here, the one of the first thing that they wanted to show is that you can actually uh, jump around. So there's actually a little little gap. Uh, yeah. Behind you, or you can also jump there. Yes, what uh, it said, and it gives some text. Uh, yeah, yeah, shoot this. Yeah, you found a secret. Yeah. So this is basically the first room is just showing that you can have like internal walls and different walls, and here explaining people how to jump. So if you played games like Doom, they actually didn't have to jump. So that was also taught here, mm. and you really safely uh, are killing the first enemy and pressing the first button. And then we get to the more technical part. We have a bridge with water in it, which was like a miraculous back in the day because you could go under. So just go into the water ah. and you can go go for a swim. Oh yeah, yeah. And that yeah, was a big yeah. thing back in the day that you go, mm. you can actually go under things in a three-dimensional space. And they even rewarded you with the secret if you felt felt like adventurous enough to go go in here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I remember oh, playing different. Quake, and and very quickly it was impossible to go to online. With and, it. and it's very annoying when you have to press. You can't use mouse to look up and. Mm. Yeah, if you if you haven't configured it, you can put a mouse yeah. mouse uh, controls on. It fully supported yeah. mouse and keyboard. Controls. They just didn't use them as a default default so, control. So, so uh, let's yeah. let's give a couple of sentences why we put this as a as a example category for jam games. What it would mean in a jam games jam game. Yeah, for, for a jam game, this would mean a bit more like that. First, show the things that you are the most proud of in the game, mm. because many times people are uh, holding back the coolest things in their game. And you would have to play it for a, for a little while to understand uh, how the game uh, behaves and works nicely. But back in the day when you had this cool tech, you really, really wanted to show it as quickly as possible. So with Quake, the second and third level are way more boring than the first one. They put all the banks into the first level uh, because they wanted to show you all the awesome things that they were able to do with the tech. Yeah. So you should show show similar like respect to your game mechanics. Mechanics is that like don't hold them back, show them to the yeah. player. Yeah. You can see yes. that in in jam games that we yeah, like if you do some experimental things, you don't necessarily get to that part uh, that fast, but you kind of lay down the things yes. like stories and things first. Ah, no. As you could see here, they actually real time change the lighting of a room. So that's also like really cool thing to do. Yeah. Now you would just think, okay, then black, you didn't even notice that it's a cool thing. Yeah, I just wonder uh, how critical it was back in the day. Now, now there are so many games and uh, kind of the, if you think about, for instance, jam games, if you think about even your video of the jam game, it, the thing that is exciting needs to be in the, sec the first 10 seconds. So it can't be, maybe even first five seconds of the video. Otherwise, yeah. you can't attract the uh, the player's attention to download the game. Yeah. But I wonder how yeah. critical it was for for this time. I think it was still still pretty critical at this time because this is a shareware where they give the demo free for everyone, mm. and then they need players to buy the full game based right. on the experiences they got from that demo. Right. So Quake actually like almost cheats in that sense when you play the first. Uh, uh, chapter through, you actually get the boss fight. Yeah. But the rest of the games, there's actually only one another boss fight. Yeah. Because they wanted to show all the cool things in the first chapter. Yeah. But yeah, show the the cool stuff as soon as show possible. The, show the cool, cool stuff as soon as possible. Yeah. That's the that's the main main yeah. goal here. Whether it's technical or game design or audio, whatever. Yeah. So let's. That was move. the first level. Good job. Do Yay. we have another game for that, or do we 
go for the next constraint? I think we could go to the go to the next constraint because any game that we would talk about this thing would be repeating ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so slow introduction to hard topics is the next one that I have online. Yes. So Ville, yeah. if you can put a portal. Yes. Yes. Oh, no. oh. And was it that Ville you hadn't beaten portal? No, I haven't. I have some tried it at some point, but not really. See, did I have? Yeah. Oh, I love, I love Portal. Is so yeah. magical. Ah, also, a great story, of course, yeah. and music. Yeah. So Portal One, it's actually interesting because many people sometimes ask favorite video game, and. For second or third or whatever place, I couldn't put any games, but I'm always selling that the top one is first portal. Like, I just haven't found a game that has done so little bad things. So you would think in that sense, like, it's a game that I can't think of, like any negative things about. It's like perfect from beginning to an end. Uh, uh, oh, no. Let's see if I can. And I used to. Uh, about this slow introduction to hard topics is that uh, Portal wow. really shines in this in a sense that the first time you play Portal, it takes a long time because it's very foreign mechanics that you haven't used to like before. Uh, yeah. Before, like the Valve was like pushing the thinking with portals, the whole mm -hmm. marketing line of the game yeah. is that it's just teaching you how to think with portals, and so when you yeah. When you master it, this thinking of portals, Portal 1 is actually a really trivial game. Mm -hmm. So it's just basically a one long uh, uh, tutorial. tutorial, the whole game. Uh, and when I was in high school, I used to actually, I haven't done much speedrunning, but I had always this challenge uh, sometimes in the computer class of high school. Before my boss leaves, can I beat Portal One? Yeah, no. <laughs> and I, I got really good at beating Portal One, so I can I can beat it in like half an hour or something like that. Yeah. Without going off the boundaries. This is interesting in Finnish. Oh, it's Finnish. It's in Finnish. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, but I also love yeah. how the story of Portal is is in itself a tutorial training thing. So. Yeah. Yes. It's very yeah, so, meta. Meta. So if if you have time, the portal actually has a comment that you can play the game through with the developer commentary on, where they explain a lot of their design process and interesting and fun facts about the development. How about Ves Nogart Toroban Boan from the chat is is kind of asking for the perfect from beginning to the end uh, type of thinking. I also enjoyed Fez a lot. Um, so what do we think about that? Slow introduction to hard topics? Does it fit? Yes, I, I think Fez, Fez is uh, it's also a witness. It's also way well, very similar in that sense. Like it slowly, slowly builds up. Yeah. So I uh, think Fez, Fez is uh, in a sense that Fez goes more meta than portal. Yeah. In the same way that witness, witness does. It goes like a bit more artistic with some of the puzzles and things. So I think, uh, whereas Portal, anyone can beat the game. I actually once watched a stream of some someone's grandfather learning how to play the first video game with Portal. It was really interesting, and they were able to beat the game. Where I think Fetch requires a little bit of this kind of gaming experience and gaming literature of, of yourself yeah. to like gaming fully, fully like play the playful of the game. Mm. But I the think Abyss some puzzles really well are also game. a bit harder for for a beginner. Yes, yeah, and it's a little bit harder to like what to do at the beginning. You can get lost in this actually quite quickly and not really sure where to start. Yeah, start but I, with the I, game. I I thoroughly enjoy the the way that they've done the two D three D thing in the beginning. Uh, I think that it's safe to spoil it because it's so in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yes, and it's it's actually the first thing that they show in the as well yeah. it's not a spoiler in that sense so it goes with the ban but and yeah it, definitely Fez, Fez, is a, Fez is an awesome game so yeah and f for any game maker we have to be quite like you can't really hold on any like a hold on too much as a gamer you can hold on to spoilers but 
you you will spoil games to yourself because you can't play them all. Even yes. during the COVID uh, restrictions, you can't play them all. No, now the box went. There, so, do we I want think. to? Uh, so, Samuli, do you want to say a bit so more? So here, 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 the uh, what it's telling you is that portals can be in different places with different times. Uh, so it's uh, opening and closing, closing different portals to different parts of the room. Because uh, they didn't first want to give the portal gun to the player's hands because it was too much power. It was too confusing to use. Uh, so they, in the first portal, they are slowly teaching you uh, the how, the, the... How, the, how the portals themselves work mm -hmm. before yeah. they give you the power of using the gun yourself. Yeah, because it can be very confusing confusing when you just appear somewhere yeah <laughs> and it was actually it, right in the beginning in the first screen where you can when the portal opens and you can see yourself and that's actually already teaching you that oh i can see myself and yes so it understands that this is not an another world it's an yeah. another perspective to the same world yeah so let's let's go to the next one uh yes. what do we have next in uh yeah but anyways as as a, as a, like tutorializing if you haven't played portal i highly like out of all of these games as a as a game as a tutorial that explains you things without you uh deliberately getting text in your face portal mm -hmm. is the best example of all the games that we are showing here so it's yeah. worth worth of like uh, researching of these games the most. Yeah. So let's take super simple gameplay next. Yes. Yeah. Samuli, so explain this, yourself. So there, there is this term nowadays called. I think it's called hyper casual. It's the it's the games that anyone can understand and play within the first couple seconds of the game, and then start enjoying the core game loop. And I wanted to show here a very classic example of that that most people know, which is Flappy Bird. Yay, I get to play it. Yes, can, yeah. you, can you get it open? Yeah, I think so. And uh, well, it's a little bit, I have to do it this way. Just wait a second. Yeah, I, I yeah. keep talking. You can keep taking. So with yeah. this kind of like a super simple gameplay, I think it really shines as a, as a uh, introducing uh, people to the game because they get to play the game immediately and they get to understand how the game works immediately. It restricts the depth of the game a lot and you may need to, like, if you want to make a more complex game, you need to then slowly ramp up the difficulty by other means than the core gameplay, like level design and uh, time challenges or uh, multiplayer challenges or something like that. But if you can make your core gameplay as simple as pressing a one button, and uh, or especially with the with the uh, mobile phone, just by tapping your screen, it's immediate input from that that position. Uh, that's one of the one of the best tutorials. So one other example I could give is uh, there's a, one game that is made for cat for iPad, which just shows things for cats that they can tap. And even cats understand how to play that game because it's all yeah. about just tapping the iPad screen. A lot so of the, can, yeah, a yeah. lot of the dot io games are exactly on this hyper casual, hyper casual uh, stream. I uh, sorry, I can't talk while doing this. This is an eye. Yeah, that's why, that's why I try to keep the keep thing <laughs> hard to launch yeah. things. <laughs> Yeah, you're better than me. I only got one there. Oh, I, I think that I had a huge high, high score back in the day, but then some of my colleagues went somewhere like a few hundreds. Oh, a few hundreds. That's pretty. I, yes. I've got I've gotten like double digit. <laughs> yeah, those were those were crazy times. How how far have people in it, people got in this? If you have a certain obsessive share? nature and you are good with focusing, I think this is perfect game for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's super yeah. addictive. And this is what the hyper casual also aims for. But then also during the mobile game era, 
uh, one button was almost like a tech uh, pos- tech kind of um, requirement because the devices had so many different button layouts. So now we talk about hyper casual, and back in the day we talked about one button games, for instance. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's actually another reason why many of the games didn't have that many inputs is that the phones couldn't register more than one button at the time. At the time, yeah. Yeah, there was a technical limitation of that as well. And this is perfectly like this type of games where you limit the controllers is perfect jam game as well. Yeah, there's plenty of jam games that have done this fully, and I've also used it in some of my jam games, especially those that I made in one hour. But Samoli, tell us about if it's a super simple game uh, gameplay, like if you want to go a bit beyond the one button things, what would you do yeah. in a jam project? Yeah, so uh, go a little bit more depth in that, that I was saying while I was setting up a game is that because the core gameplay itself is so simple, you need to get the depth and the complexity from other parts of the game. So you can have varied level design or some kind of competitive nature or just have interesting story or art that proceeds with the simple yeah. clicks. It doesn't always have to be challenging. No, it yeah. can also be just like a really nice experience that is really simple to play through. Yeah. Yeah. And but... also many many rhythm games like function functionality. So you can have like a very like musical games where people can like just get into the groove of tapping the game. Okay, someone said that they have. 246 high score in Flappy Bird. <laughs> I do have a screenshot of my high score as well, and it was it was probably double digit, digit not hundreds. Uh, yeah, getting to double digits that's already a, already an accomplishment to it my. Is. But I think you, you, you'd you really need to have your space, and this is one of the kind of I don't know who would do like a full eight hour stream on Twitch and just playing Flappy Bird, but I'm sure that that also yeah. exists. M- must exist. Must, if it doesn't, we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> but there yeah. are tons of tons of these, obviously. And it's interesting how, how in a professional space with the hyper casuals, uh, you can easily do a fast test, like a market test even with the games and see which ones are taking more wind under their wings. So when you do simple games, you can put them on the market quite fast. And then you can test around with art style and you can test around with uh, like a thematic layer, whether it's a bird or whether it's kind of a flying cow or whatever you want to do. So those things matters. And then this kind of a gameplay part is, is kind of less of the Less of the meaning of the play. Well, here it is quite of the meaning, but I do still love the character design of this. Ah, okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> there actually was a, a Flappy Bird game. Flappy Bird came out where everyone made different Flappy Bird clones. And right. there was like a few hundred submissions there. That was one of the funniest game jams I've made because <laughs> not only playing the other people's different Flappy Bird games was fun. It was also a game that is like really easy yourself to make and then just like uh, totally twist the, twist the gameplay to some another another direction because it's a good baseline of going forward. Yeah. So yeah, I think I that if, if somebody wants to create a Flappy Bird game, just uh, it could be one hour jam or it could be could be something with a twist. So maybe you can even use the whole week of making <laughs> making your own design variations of the Flappy uh-huh. Bird. Uh, and it was also interesting how it was taken off the whole game and how the crea- creator took it down after. Yeah, there was a, there was a lot think. of drama and thing. Uh, All right, let's go to no wrong play, uh, no wrong way to play. Yes. So is it Arco or Ville? Are you going to play? Proteus? I can. I will play Proteus. Yeah, I can. After that, also show the show the. Crocorale. Yeah. So this this category, no wrong way to play, 
is about games where there's actually no basically no goals or no uh, failure states so they are more close to toys than games in that sense but i'm fine calling them games as well i don't <laughs> i don't want to start to fight semantics here it it's it's it, you are you are selling it in steam and it's under game section so that's that's a game <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. so uh, proteus is it's a little bit older game uh, and it's one of the games that started popularizing this kind of like a way of making games that are just places where you find your own fun or do your own thing so proteus is a game where you can enter a procedurally generated island and it's every yeah. time it's a different island so other there is no two same islands in the world and people are finding different things from different islands and just like either enjoying them themselves or sharing them online with other players the different yeah. finds that they get from the game and, and you can't go away from here it was like no i must go to the <laughs> island so there's only one way to pray Yes, yeah, nice and it has limitation. really, really simple, simple controls and graphics, and it's also very heavily based on audio, so it's like very audiovisual experience. So yeah. it has a lot of procedural audio things going on as well. And I think these kind of things uh, also work really well. Like they are pretty simple and easy to do for. Uh, jam games mm -hmm. so you would could call these even like mood pieces or these kind of like little interesting technical things so here you already found your own fun of trying to catch the frog yeah. <laughs> is it a frog i don't know i thought it, it, I like thought a it was a bunny maybe yeah. it's maybe it's a bunny it doesn't yeah, have ears a... yeah so uh, i got job but no <laughs> 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 what's there and it's interesting to see, like, uh, is there some castle in the distance? But, I mean, like, some of these kind of exploratory games, they do have some type of um, hint system or something so that the players would get the best out of it. So if you just get the... If you just get the game itself and then there is a lot to explore, but the players never realize that there are, like... I think that the limitation of not going back is one of those design uh, conventions. But like to get the hints of how to explore and how to get things. Like for instance in Minecraft you get... I think you get the notification that you found something. Yeah, you get the, get the crafting tree. That you yeah. know like what you can craft next. Yeah. So so in a jam game uh, even like... Maybe there, maybe there is a way to still hint the players even though it would be fully just exploring. Uh, yeah, definitely. Genre. Like, use this as a as a like a springboard, and build upon it. This is already like really old game, uh, and the reason why I wanted to show is this that this is basically one of those games that started to popularize these things. So there are newer mm. games like Mountain, for example. Uh, this is a, also a good example for a jam game, like very simple graphics, still very beautiful game. You can spend time to. To do the music and so, do we have other games that we would want to mention on this that are more and modern? Yeah, or I, I, recent? Could, I could show the show the crocodile. Croco yeah. Let's see. Let's see how it how it launches. Oh yeah, I could have uh, could have shown how this. You can just end the game, but no. Yeah, so the end, ending of the Proteus section is nice. The longer you hold escape, the more it closes the eye of the player. Mm. Yeah. So it like naturally shuts down the... Mm. Shuts down. Yeah, and then you ju if you... I just kept on doing that, and then it closed the whole game. And yeah, it's just like... That was a dream. Go back to sleep. So I think we we're going slightly over time, but but uh, hopefully everybody. Is, is can... it fine? Yeah. I think it's perfectly yeah. fine, at least for us. I don't know about yeah, yeah, the others. Yeah, yeah. They already get the yeah. constraint. Um, yes. Yeah. So, but anyway. So yeah. Yeah. Let's we just have a couple, couple of oh, examples to go still. 
this yeah. is very I, uh very interesting gameplay <laughs> yeah so so let's let's oh open. it's supposed to be like that oh i can oh just wait a second i'll i'll scroll it i, I mean resize this thing so it's an emulator yes i will do that it was it was working yesterday so yeah i don't know yeah. why the, the regular comment it was working yesterday yeah it's it's always always the same same thing there's a picture of uh, where you can see how the game yeah there you can see it. we have one more uh, category coming up and then we will close close yeah. the session pretty soon I hope that everybody has enjoyed these examples and and the whole game design process in the in the general and larger sense is always built on referencing other games and looking at how games are done. Uh, oh, I had to press the power button in the <laughs> of course <laughs> in the actual, actual phone. Let's see if I can make this slightly bigger. Yeah. So here we have a have a game that we made for kids and oh i was rotating it a little bit too much where is it this one yeah so uh this was done in uh i will turn the volume a little bit more down this was done in a in a game jam uh for little kids called pikku kakkonen game jam and when you're designing games for little kids, they don't actually really care what is the actual goal of the game. So this was an example of this kind of fully freeform game where you can drive this little nice car by rotating your phone. And wherever you press in the screen, something happens. So all the buttons in the screen are interactive. And what we found really funny is that different uh, kids were doing different things in this game. So some some kids were collecting all the, all the all the princess friends, and someone was afraid of the blue things and they didn't want to go there. Some someone wasn't collecting anyone into the into the life, but they enjoyed doing doing flips and backflips and other things with the with the crocodile. And we also had two different uh, background musics. So somewhere we're just listening to music and chilling uh, with the game. So this is an example of a game where we really approach the uh, game design in a way that we just provide player a bunch of different things to do. But we don't know what are actually the things that player end up using at the, at the end game. <coughs> so... You can basically give players a lot of uh, functionality and uh, clutter for game that doesn't actually affect anything directly gameplay-wise, but they are just fun things to do. Mm. And this kind of ex exploratory nature quite quickly like uh, lets you find a way to like play the game in the way you want to play it and enjoy the game game a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's, way, yeah it's, also way, for like, the, it's also for yeah. the adult players, like the Sims, the whole famous or famousness or popularity of the game was that there's so many different ways that you can play it, even though there are goals that you can beat, but still yes. that there is so many goals that you can set for yourself. Yeah, and the simplest way of like providing this is that like, let the player pick, do they want to play with the game bat or keyboard and mouse? That's already like a option of preference of what to do in the game. All right, are we ready for the last one? Yes. Yeah. And there was actually in our Discord community, there was a question like uh, uh, how to form teams uh, during online game jams. Maybe we could also discuss yep. a little bit about that. We can discuss it about after the last one that we are uh, revealing and then yeah then kind of helping people to get teams yeah yeah 
And the f last category is the basically the the category we added because this is a jam, and <laughs> and very very many jam do this, and many uh, bigger games like we were able to see the journey doing very similar thing as well. Uh, so... It's just giving giving the hints of play. In. So and maybe it's tutorial. Yes, yes, yeah. I will, I will share it. I will share it. Yeah. So the embedded tutorial was the was the name of this category, where you just put the category in the game. So here it says arrow keys. You figure out quite quickly that you can move with arrow keys. Then it yeah. says hold C. You will very quickly know that if I press Z, I can shoot. And yeah. then you know this, you can kill the cube. Then it says hold X. You will really quickly then notice that what happens when you are holding X. You get this like a little win. And then the last one is hold C. And if you hold the C button in your keyboard. Yeah, I actually changed. Oh, you changed the controls. The controls. Yeah, the mouse, because it's easier to do. But actually, I, I also lo lost the sound somehow. We can hear, we the, hear the sound. We hear the sound. But yeah, but the, the third button that you never pressed was a C button in the game. Yeah, did I? Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's the one like very practical example of if your if your player goes and changes, then you don't function anymore. Yeah. Which is totally fine on champ games. Obviously, when yeah. you do do a professional game, your tutorial should maybe reflect the key changes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. we can we can see this a lot in jam games, and I think it's it's very it's still very nice way to do the to the tutorial. You know, some of the jam games they just put it put instructions on the page. Yeah. So but this is instead better. of putting putting instructions in the game, at least like some kind of signboard showing the showing the controls in the game. Uh, and in uh, this game, at the beginning, it was like very slow. So you had your time to check all the controls. Yeah. And now I forgot actually where I put uh, <laughs> that one. It's fine, it's fine. That game also, another one thing that is very good for maybe games and games as well. You can see Villa is like dying a lot in the game, <laughs> but that game doesn't have lives. So I let the player have infinite lives so they can get through the game no, no matter how bad they are. Because I think it's more uh, uh, beneficial to actually show the whole game for players than just gatekeep them of not being able to see all the things they die. Mm. Yeah, so it's just a like mild a, distraction. Yeah. Also, a good example for when you don't have time in game jam to do everything, so it can be a design choice as well. Yeah, here the visuals are super cool. Yeah, yeah. Alright. I also like the song. <laughs> <laughs> I can't yeah, stop. that's a champ, champ tip for you guys as well. There's a website called uh, Open Game Art, where you can get open source and public domain music and art and audio if you don't have an artist or audio guy in your in your team. Yeah. Yeah. So this music is from there as well. Actually, I think earlier that when I played this, I found a bug. Oh, now again, like this, or I don't know, it's the feature when you don't, I don't see the ship anymore. Yeah, it's a, it's a short time game. <laughs> you always yeah. have a limited time of respawning, so you can respawn yeah, inside walls if you want. Oh. But don't, don't go inside walls to respawn, it's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Should we continue to, yeah. the, to the Discord uh, questions? Yeah. So um, maybe just a short recap from uh, from uh, Samuli. What is the design constraint? So design constraint is minimal instructions. What does that mean in this jam? Yes. So try to make a game uh, where at the beginning of the game the player is. Uh, treated like very respect respectfully and like eased in the game 
easily without blatantly throwing a manual at them. At the, this yeah. time, actually, I could show now as the, well. The a blatantly th throwing of... manuals uh, thing. Yeah, yeah blatantly yeah. throwing manuals. So if I get Vectorex game here, this is this is from 80s. Uh, these games. Uh, oh, this doesn't have the manual, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, picked, I picked the wrong game from the shelf. Like, uh, these games back in the day uh, came always with the manual that explained how to play the game in a very similar way that a board game nowadays explains the game. Yeah. Because they didn't yet have this kind of like a way of tutorializing players really well. And it was the same in many of the old arcade cabinets. They had like a very board game-like tutorial printed next to the cabinet that mm. how to play the game. So let's try to avoid that, that you would need any external resources of playing the game and uh, reduce the amount of reading needed to yeah. uh, fully get the concept of the game. Yeah, and this is very interesting if, if you are doing a board game and how to introduce this. Yeah, design. that is true. So Klaus Hecke is commenting on the chat that I definitely now want to make a game that literally throws a manual item at the player. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a way of way of tackling this as well. Yeah. You can have the manual as a game. Yeah. <laughs> What do we think about, for instance, the, uh, keep explaining and nobody explodes? Keep talking. Keep and nobody... talking and nobody explodes. Yeah. So that that ga that game is basically a mixture of many of these categories. So in a sense, it's a tutorial by other player, yeah. where the other player is doing the whole tutorial because he's reading the book, and you are just enjoying the game as a person who is trying to solve the puzzle. So, it's, in yeah. a so way, it's basically offloading the tutorial to another person. So in a way, it is 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 a kind of both uh, a minimal instruction, but also not minimal instruction yes. game. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and I think like things like that are totally fine here. So it's it's all about just just think how you explain the game to mm. player a lot more in this case and yeah. put a little bit more. Uh, effort into that because that's a, often when you have like a very limited time of making a game you don't have time to really explain it well mm. and it's yeah. a common problem with game jam games is that i download a game and i try to play it and i just don't, don't understand it even yeah. if it's a really good game yeah. and and for example ludum dare where i always dump, download like 100 jam games and play 100 ludum dare games because yeah. it really encourages you to play other ludum dare games there, I'm always constantly like having to have the tabs of the games open to reference the controllers, for example. Like, what do I need to press in this game? Yeah. Or yeah. what do I, what do I need to plug into even like start the game? Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not actually that difficult to just, for instance, to put the image of the controller or the keys there, like the the last uh, category. So in a yeah. sense, it's not difficult. We just forget it easily. Yeah. Yes. But then again, you have to think that it's a little bit uh, peaceful to start, so players have a little bit of time to actually. Mm. Yeah. yeah so, for example, like... many uh, many good local multiplayer games, uh, when you select a character, you can actually start playing as a character in selection screen while other people are still picking their characters. Yeah. So you can learn the controls in a safe yeah. safe place before the mayhem begins. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously there are lots of more examples of design conventions of how to make a good tutorial or interesting tutorials. Uh, these categories made by Samoli are for you to use and kind of get inspired in a way to approach a game jam project or approach a game uh, project in itself from a different direction than just to kind of think about the theme and the, the kind of a funny idea for a game. So think about the Think about the design challenge. What would you want to choose? What kind of things would you like to do with the tutorial way? And then everything that you build around the game could kind of support that. So this is an exploration of making the, the tutorial things interesting or, or well, minimal instructions of, of playing the game. Um, there is a lot of space now to explore. So you have to yourself set the design constraint 
a, a bit more specifically to you. There is a week mm. uh, uh, of time, so you don't need to rush in uh, in a similar way than with the two to three day jams. But then at the same time, the time is limited. So it's not that you do four, <laughs> four days of kind of brainstorming what you would do and then just a couple of days of jamming. Well, that's not the wrong way to do it either. But generally in game jams, it's good to proceed to the gameplay as soon as possible. So the theme mm. part and the the stories, the characters, the, the world, or whether it's abstract, whether it's um, using a digital platform or whether it's analog game, these are all for you to choose. And um, we're looking forward to what you come up with and we will play your games games next week once you have uploaded that. Yeah. Um, I think that we've talked a lot of the constraint already, so a couple of notes about the team forming and the next steps for the jam itself. Yeah. So we have a Discord channel that can be used for team forming. We will regroup with Villet to kind of think about how to best facilitate you there. So we will take uh, a bit of time right after this, uh, or maybe, well, mm. you have to wait for a little bit, but we will be there. So make sure that you are on the Games Now Discord channel, which is generally for the entire lecture series. So Games Now is an open lecture series where we do have YouTube channel and we're streaming lectures uh, as our main interest for the open lecture series. Uh, there are lots of things to also get inspired in those lectures. So you can pick up the youtube.com slash games now alto fi. So that is, a, that is the channel that you are at currently. And mm -hmm. for, the, for the reasons of the distance working and social distancing, we are doing game jams this spring. So we are not having lectures uh, from the location of the Alto University premises. We are doing another jam in May with a similar concept. So I, I, we hope that you like this and you will join also the next one with a, a new constraint and a new guest. So this, yeah. been, this has been delightful to start with Samoli. Yes. <laughs> with all these examples and also uh, deep knowledge of how to, how to kind of suit this in the jamming environment and uh, we are we are still meeting Samuli next week, <laughs> so that's gonna yeah, be yeah. Looking forward to playing all the games. Yeah, indeed. But if you don't, if you already have a team, just go ahead. We might ask you to kind of somehow uh, notify us who is working on what. So still be on the Discord channel, and yeah, uh, yeah if you are interested in this baby, it's very nice to do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my green screen stuff is not working. The with that, but... stickers which you now see in a mirror image. Yeah. <laughs> so... Games Now Online Jam 1. You can collect the whole series when we get new ones for the later Indeed. online Indeed. Uh, so, so there is physical stuff. And I can show you the way that uh, that these are packaged. So we will ship it. to. So we'll do a raffle for, for all the teams that shipped there, or I mean, submitted their games. So these are, you don't have to, we have three of the, three of the bottles packaged. So they're also safe for you to receive. <laughs> yeah. So we will mail them uh, after, after the submission raffle has been done and the stickers we will give instructions how to get the stickers also later um to yeah. remind you that there are a couple of kind of a fixed things in the submission form such as the gameplay video it's super important but also a list of credits list of tools that you use and uh what nots uh, so if you're not aware if you haven't used each io before it requires a, a one from the team to create a user um, account for each IO and it is a platform that is widely used by game jams. So if you want to do more game jams, there's a lot to explore also from their site. Is there something yeah. that somebody would like to still add for the jammers? 
not really just have fun enjoy the enjoy the jamming and remember to take care of yourself as well but you have a week long jam so hopefully no crunching through the night yeah. required yeah and yeah. Where, where where could people find like uh, inspiration for themes and and kind of what to look for as game ideas so i think one thing is that this uh, this game jam called there uh, and every year people vote uh, what the theme is. So you could look into the past vote things that didn't get the number one. So there's a lot of good themes in Ludum there that were never used, but were voted really highly. So if you need a secondary inspiration, there's a good themes to get, get from there. Yeah, there are also like game name generators and things like that that you can playfully use. You can take a book from your bookshelf and just decide that you do a game from the first word that you put your finger on on the page. Yeah. So there are tons of ways for you to also fix yourself, another constraint, uh, to get yeah. started as soon as possible. Um, and also you can you can share them on the Discord channel and they're even possible to vote for them, like putting emo emoticons after them and if yeah. you want to share, share the possible teams for other jammers yeah so we'll we'll come back in a in about half an hour or so to the discord channel to think with you i kind of facilitate maybe some of you will regroup tomorrow but i hope yeah. you enjoyed the the constraint stuff and you'll have fun um, jamming so that's that's yes. the main thing that that's... we want you to do uh it's always um, fun to explore new constraints and and old ones as well yeah and uh, please participate in our study. It, it's not any in any way mandatory, but we are very happy if you take a little bit of time to fill in the survey after the jam. And it, it's completely anonymous, of course. And... We'll share uh, some links on the Discord side on the specific channel. So wait for, for that thing and also share with others. Just to remind uh, you guys with the, with the each IO page, this is the address for it. So it's each.io slash jam slash gn uh, dash online dash jam or dash one. And uh, so this this is the address for the for, for the jam itself. And you can if you're already on the Discord channel, you can find it. And then of course if you can't find this, this is gamesnow.alto.fi. So in a way also you can see it. No, it was there. So everything should be in our on our website. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So so there should be ways to find things. Um, I'm really positively also surprised how well the tech absolutely now worked because we must reveal that four minutes before we got things working, before we got online. Yeah. <laughs> so before that everything was glitching specifically with the with the screen share so wow this is just just absolutely yeah. amazing <laughs> yeah all the games worked <laughs> yeah yes yes all that right so great. i hope to see your games on monday i mean sunday you have to submit that but see you all again on the stream if you're not uh planning on jamming just come back and see what people were creating and yeah. looking forward and invite to your friends as well uh, say again uh, invite your friends as well yes the... so yeah. this yeah. is not you you don't have to i think that this is stored as a recording if people are interested to look at the constraint um lecture uh afterwards and you can go through that to get more tips and and kind of carefully select what you want to do but as a reminder, you don't have to be fixed with some of these categories. You can choose mm -hmm. another minimal instruction way, and we will be interested to see how it works. All right. Ready to <laughs> close the stream? Yes. yes. Okay. Goodbye. It was very, it very, was very nice. much fun. And bye, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Bye.